Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. We are global here on TMS Roundtable. I'm thrilled to be here. It's six months now, every Monday night since the end of March. And I'm a little sad that Corona is still here, but I'm very happy that TMS Roundtable is still here. <laughs> and I'm happy to introduce and co-host with my amazing friend and colleague, Rose Hoy. Good morning. Hi, good morning. And I'd like to introduce you to Lindsay. Lindsay is the executive producer of Speaking Grief. She's produced an amazing film about grief mm. and how we avoid it and how we keep away from it. And we, uh, we're asking her to share her interest and why she came to this area. Hopefully you will all manage to watch it at some stage, even if you've got no personal um, notions about your grief, but it's also about how we avoid other people's grief. Lindsay is uh, part of Penn State University and a PBS affiliate station. And uh, she's interested in um, the human condition. How does that sound? Welcome, Lindsay. Can you tell us a little Thank bit you, about Rose. yourself? And how you came to this. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. So this was such a delightful invitation to receive. Yes, yeah, so I'm a uh, senior producer at WPSU. We're a, a Penn State University licensed uh, public media station in the US, so a PBS station. And as, as Rose said, I am just very interested in kind of what makes us human and in our shared experience, um, and especially any of those shared experiences that helps us build connection with each other and, and build deeper, more authentic relationship. I think especially right now, um, at least in the US, there is such a uh, focus on what divides us. And it's easy to lose sight of the fact that we're fundamentally the same. We all, um, we all love. And when we lose what or who we love, we grieve. And that is sort of the, the basis for speaking grief. Wow, beautiful, mm. well said. T tell us about how, just for those that actually haven't watched it, although mm. Tova has put it up over several days, um, tell us about people avoiding grief. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that you found, isn't it? Um, how they avoid expressing it or even expressing to other people their grief. And they have this saying, oh, well, I don't know what to say. But in actual fact, you don't need to say anything. That's, yeah, that's just it. Or actually, I don't know what to say is a really powerful phrase because I think it does justice to uh, the depth of the experience. I think we don't like to say that because we don't like to admit that we don't have all the answers or that we're not in control. But that's something that over and over people said is probably the best thing you can say is just, I don't know what to say, but I'm here and I care about you and I'll be here with you through this. So you know, in the movie, the, the father of the son who got killed in the car accident said, and this was surprising. He said, people don't talk to me. I just, even if they asked me about my son, I would have loved to talk about him. And you're thinking, whoa, it makes such sense, but why am I like, sweating and just smiling and thinking that, that I don't want to bother them. He's like, I just wanted them to talk to me. And then Rose brought that, up yeah. that the, the other part of the movie where the people were in the grocery store and everyone was going the opposite way, the people that were grieving and it was just so... That was the one. Yeah, right. The movie is incredible. The documentary is for every human being to watch. So oh, I'll be putting you. it out for the next few weeks. but. Go ahead and share about about that, the difficulty. Yeah, so that um, both of those things are very common um, that we are. So backing up to why we wanted to do this as a, as a public media station, we always look for things where we really think we can have an impact. That's something we talk a lot about is is actually enacting some sort of a change. And grief is a space where despite the fact that it's that it's universal and that we all go through it it's a space that we don't talk about a lot and that there hasn't been that much direct attention on that's starting to change which is great but 
one of the things that happens in our grief, uh, uh, and I'll say that the project focuses on death-related grief, but it's really all of the principles and themes apply to any kind of pain or loss because grief is so um, present with us in so many different experiences. But what's really tragic is that often on top of whatever triggers the addition, the initial loss or the initial grief. And grief is also a response to change. I like to, I like to point that out. There doesn't even necessarily have to be a loss. It could just be a change in your life. Um, and even like happy changes and, you know, we call things happy. Um, but anytime there's a big life transition, but what can happen is because um, we, I, I think it's because we tend to focus so much on um, again, happiness or, you know, or, or being productive or, or whatnot. Um, we don't like to hold a lot of space for uncomfortable feelings. And I, and I don't like binary labeling of feelings as being good or bad. Um, but we don't, we aren't very comfortable when things hurt, when they make us sad, when they make us angry, we don't often like to address those feelings in ourselves. And we, and when you sit with someone else and they're in deep grief or in some kind of deep pain, it's uncomfortable. It's really hard to sit with someone you care about and watch them hurt and not be able to do anything. And so I think that feeling of being ineffectual or, or just being stumped for what to do leads a lot of people to take a different kind of action, which is they stay away from their person. Because as you said, um, Tova, they'll think, oh, I'm going to say the wrong thing. If I mention, if it's a death, if I mention the person who died, that's just going to upset them more. So then I don't know what to say. I'm not going to say anything. I'll just avoid them. And, and, and I think I'm being kind by doing that. What we don't realize is that, you know, that person's actually in a space where they're, they're, they're probably have never had such a need for connection and relationship. And that's being taken away from them when they needed yeah. it most, not because the support person is a bad person, but because we don't talk about this, we don't learn about it. We just have no clue what to do when we encounter it. And so we thought, you know what? If we can make this, if we can normalize this, if we can normalize grief, if we can validate that it's okay to grieve, that it's okay to be sad and angry and all of those other feelings that make up grief, and if we can make it less scary for people, like they have to have all these answers when they show up for someone, we can really change that isolation. You know, we can't fix whatever caused the grief, but we can fix any of those losses that would result from people being uncomfortable with the grief so that hopefully people don't have to grieve as alone going forward. Cause it, as you noted, that's, we avoid our people sometimes to the point where we will literally turn and cross the street or run away from them. And they see you when you do that, <laughs> just so you know, like we're not being slick when we do that. They're aware, they're aware. Um, but you know, and it's tough because well, you also want to respect the, uh, boundaries. Yeah. I love the, uh, the clip where the, um, the daughter, the mother and daughter are in the supermarket and, they spot Mrs. Smith running, running away. I, can, I can't remember the dialogue, but it's so true because it is, it's awful because that whole idea of not being able to say anything. And yet, you, as you say, you don't need to say anything. You just need to show up yeah, and, and make sure that the person is, is supported. And, you know, grief is one of those things in therapy that needs to come up about their losses, as you say, because underneath that is the anger about the loss, the anger about uh, lack of support, maybe um, sadness, you know, all those feelings and love, of course, we're made for love. So underneath that loss is, is a loving spirit that wants to be allowed out. And, and, you know, when people grieve, they want to talk about their loved one or their hated one or whatever. They want to, to observe it. And, and Lindsay and I earlier on, we were talking about losing animals, weren't we? And how mm -hmm. how that is often a, a way of actually getting to our grief because an, an animal is so dependent on us and then we lose them and uh, it allows us to actually um, let the tears come, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love um, that you said someone you love or you hate because I think, you know, we don't, especially with death or with any kind of major loss, we don't leave space for that a lot. We think if you had a, a difficult or challenging yeah. relationship, someone and they die, that somehow you're not entitled to feel some way about that. And it's completely not true. It's like, wow. it, you know, 
know, people talk about grief as this extension of the exactly. relationship that you yeah. had with the person. So that doesn't end just because they're no longer physically here. You're grieving That's what right. you didn't have. With Actually, you didn't have You're anyone up right. on the show like that, did you? What's mm. that, with a, with a relationship? Uh, yeah. Also, Lindsay, some... mention... A... I was thinking, um, can you just talk a little bit about how you've actually sectioned off different, uh, if you if people go to your um, uh, um, website, you've actually sectioned mm -hmm. off uh, different um, dialogues. Can you talk a little bit about how you've pr put that together so people can actually go into separate spaces as well as watching the movie? What's it called? Background. It's, there's a word for it, isn't there? Um, other things that weren't included in the actual movie yeah. you've got um so, more information. so we like to um yeah we like i always like to i'm glad you brought that up to make the point too we're, we're talking a lot about the documentary but the documentary is one part of we call it a multi-platform project so it's not just even like oh this is stuff that didn't make it into the movie we set out from the beginning to create um something that would intentionally be part website, part documentary, part social media. Like we use social media a lot for learning and for creating original content for those platforms. We also do a lot of events and discussions because we didn't want to just create a movie that people would watch, you know, once or maybe twice and then not really do anything with. We wanted to start a conversation. So if you go to the website, it's actually in the process of being redesigned to make it e even easier to find some of these things. But so you'll get there and right on the home page, there's a link to watch the documentary. But I would encourage you either if you um, Again, there'll be some new buttons up shortly, but right now, if you either scroll down or you go up to the menu in the corner, there are um, sections on supporting grief, understanding grief, and there will soon be a section on grieving that has just some wonderful instruction um, and guidance that's been pulled from research and experts across the, across the country. There are hundreds of videos beyond just the documentary, which is great and we're very proud of, but there are um, there are profiles of the families that are in the film that are separate from what you see in the film. They're, they're more backstory on the families, but there's also a lot of people um, that we profiled specifically for the website and that we're hoping to keep adding to so we can sort of validate that none of us are alone in this experience, even though it feels like it, that there are other people um, who are hurting too and make it normal and okay to see that. Um, and then we have a lot of interviews with grief professionals um, providing that are that are chunked. You know, most of these videos are, um, you know, like one to three minutes at, at the longest. They might be maybe five minutes, but they're specifically created um, to get to get specific information when you need it. Um, and there again, there are sections both if you're someone who feels that they're actively grieving and you want to learn more about and understand this experience, because so many people have told me that our silence around it leads to this misunderstanding where they feel like there's something wrong with them or that, you know, that their grief experience is so out of line with how we think of grief um, that we want to make sure people understand that what they're feeling is probably normal. Um, and then for support people, there's just such great practical guidance on there about, um, yeah, some of those things you can say, some things maybe to avoid saying sometimes because grief is so individual and dynamic. Mm. Sometimes it's easier. We don't like to scare people off with the don'ts, but sometimes it is easier to say, like there are some common things a lot of us tend to say, particularly around death-related grief, that, that pretty universally people have shared with us don't really land um, with the comforting grace that they're meant to. You know, every, everything happens for a reason, or at least you had they had a good life, or they're in a better place. Like those are well-intentioned, but usually not not the best things. Um, the best medicine usually in any kind of grief is actually just validation. So if they're expressing, wow. if someone's expressing pain to you, instead of feeling, and this is where it's not our fault because we've been taught, um, you know, we're, we're there to cheer our person up. If we're showing up to support someone, our job is to make them laugh, get a smile on their face and, and keep marching forward. But really the kindest thing you can do if they're saying this really hurts, whatever I'm going through really hurts, instead of trying to downplay that or, or put a positive spin on it, it's really powerful just to say, yeah, it's, it's really hard what you're going through. You know, I wish I knew what to say for you. I wish I could take it away. I know I can't. This, this must be very hard. Wow. Um, and that is validation yeah. is such great medicine. Wow. 
Yeah, yeah. Sure. Were many people reluctant to talk to you or was everyone keen to talk to you? Surprisingly, I think a lot of people assume that this would be hard to get people to talk about. But once you open up a space for grief, because we don't talk about it, everybody has things they want to share. Um, and as we we spoke about earlier, um, outside of even the actual project, just sort of once I became known as, as like the grief lady, um, people just were pulling me aside, people I'd known for years and workplace conversations who were just like, oh, hey, I just wanted to share, you know, my sister died 20 years ago or, you know, and it was beautiful. It was and it was really eye opening. Um, and even on, so I did a lot of, uh, phone interviews, both with people who ended up in the project and with other people who just sort of provided background information as we were shaping what we wanted to do with this project. And those conversations would be very intense and very raw and there'd often be tears and, um, it was, you know, they were hard. And so I would apologize and I would, you know, at the end of the call, I'd be like, you know, thank you for talking with me. I'm so sorry that I stirred all this up for you. And they would always without fail, stop me and say, this conversation is something I never get to have. This was a wow. gift to be able to talk about this and not have somebody try to shut it down. So that was in itself a, a really valuable learning experience. Wow. Actually, that's the most valuable learning experience for all of us. When we get uncomfortable about things, we want to get rid of it. We want to cast it aside. And of course, it also opens up our own uh, sadness and grief. And, and you know, one of the grief counselling things people say for people that are stuck in grief is go to someone else's funeral and, and cry there as well. Mm. You know, if you can't cry for your own sadness, cry for other people's sadness. And mm. it's a, wow. an amazing sort of a piece of advice, really. Well, and it's, I think that's when we're stuck that... about being stoic and that whole yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say too, what, what um were you saying, to, Nancy? Um to to the point of, of being stuck, I think something else that happens is because and I touched on this, is we don't talk about grief. So we have this idea mainly from movies, honestly, or or books or you know, kind of pop culture of what, what we think grief looks like or how we think it works. And when we don't, when our experience doesn't line up with that, then on top of feeling sad, we end up feeling uh, ashamed or like we're, we're weak because we should be done with this in six weeks or whatever people think people all have kind of a different internal marker for how long grief lasts, or we think I'm not, um, you know, my grief doesn't look like this representation of grief. So then on top of feeling the pain of grief, we're also adding self judgment. Sometimes we're getting judgment from other people because they're making those same comparisons. And all of this stuff just gets piled on it. So that's something else we really tried to convey to people is that grief is grief is so unique. It is different to every single person. It is different for every single kind of loss. Um, even if, you know, we had a lot of people who'd had multiple losses and they'll say, you know, my grief for my mom was awful, but then my grief for my spouse was a different kind of awful or my grief for my child. Um, and that, that, there's no roadmap for this. There's no, um, you know, people get kind of stuck in the stages of grief. And those are really more aspects of grief. Like you might have those, but it's not, um, I think the biggest message is that it's not something that we should be pushing people to like check a box and say, I'm done with my grief because it doesn't really work like that. Usually you, you know, you, you become reconciled to it. You learn to integrate it, but there might still be something you know, you might be having a good day six months down the road, um, something triggers a memory or a feeling of grief. And then, and again, if we have that idea of like, I thought I was done with this, that can set you back and frustrate you. Whereas if we can shift this narrative to like, that's just kind of how it is that you, you might have this throughout your life. Um, we can be more compassionate with ourselves and more compassionate with other people. Well, Lindsay, you know, you're, 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 yeah. you're well, that's, like, that's the key, isn't it? Yeah. If you're compassionate like you, with yourself. You've got a right. way of actually mixing up with other right. people. Right. Sorry, mm -hmm. Tyler. So no, no. So it's interesting because your your background is not about chronic pain, and yet you're saying everything that Rose and I talk about with our clients. It's like it's unbelievable because when we suppress these feelings or these 
you know, memories that need to come up and need to be processed or integrated. Um, it is the basis for chronic pain. And this is the scientific research that we, we read about and we talk about and we write about because it does affect the way the brain starts to protect. And in that protection mechanism, inflammation and spasm and weakness and the body lives it, like a lion is coming and all it is is that you know i haven't yet grieved that my mom died or that i had an abusive childhood like it doesn't matter i mean i call things positive stress the brain doesn't mm -hmm. differentiate between positive and negative stress it just feels your pressure or the unconscious doing what it does and i was going to ask something and this is something maybe rose might want to mention talk about too but you know, when did it start that, number one, we we shouldn't talk about feelings? And when did it start that these kind of feelings like grief and anger and fear were less talked about? Like, when did that all, because we're looking at changing a, a, a universal way that we live and cultures that push it away even more. So what, did you ever think about, that could be a whole nother documentary. Yeah, I think I'll speak at least in the U.S. Actually, and I was like, that? what's that? Did you find different cultures um, expressed it differently? Yeah, that was something um, we had a lot of people ask about. And we didn't get too far into that in terms of, you know, from more of like an anthropological um, or sociological space. We were more looking at for the human beings. And we were very intentional about showing diverse representations of grief from people's um, racial or cultural backgrounds to their religious beliefs um, to the type of loss they've experienced and where they were in the loss and i'll say um, one thing i was going to say is i always like to point out so i'm a filmmaker by trade so a lot of the information i'm relaying is is from greater minds than mine um, professionals working in the field and the um the families that we worked with on this project but in terms of Tova's point, uh, I think this, I, I'm not 100% sure where it started. I've heard some people say it's as, it was as early as within maybe like the last 50 or 60 years, at least in the US. And there's some changes around how, um, how we even do funerals now that might have contributed to this. But if you think about US culture, we are afraid of sickness. We're afraid of aging. We're afraid of dying. We're very afraid of talking about dying. And so that all plays together, like, you know, where, where maybe a hundred years ago, you would have had multi-generations of a family living in one house and you would have cared for your parents um, as they aged and you would have seen that and it would have been just much more part of your daily existence. Where now, what do we do typically? We don't feel like we can care for our people. So we they end up in um, nursing homes and there's no judgment on that. Some people need that level of care, but it just means it's another layer of removal from our daily life and our daily consciousness and then if you look at even you know in like our beauty industry there's so much emphasis on on staying young like we, we just really don't like talking about aging and the fact that people do get older and spoiler alert we all die <laughs> it's gonna happen um it's not um it's not a bad thing to say that because it's just what is uh but we've lost that somewhere along the way and so we it's the most natural thing in the world, right? Like grief is the most natural thing in the world, but we made it, we've made it so foreign and so other that it makes sense that it would seem scary. But if you start to unpack it like that, and usually what happens, I'll say, is a lot of people in the project have shared people don't really get it or you avoid it as long as you can, but then eventually, right? Like we're all going to have a grief experience. And then often once people have, have experienced, you know, some sort of an, an acute grief situation for themselves, they realize maybe where their shortcomings were with other people in their life and, and they'll come back to it. And a lot of people have said, you know, I want my friends or family or coworkers to be able to support me better, but I don't because I feel like to support me better, they'll need to suffer this too. And I don't want that for them. So part of this project is to get people there where we can do this better without having to have, have it directly affect us so that we can start these skills now and build these more authentic relationships now and live in a fuller way now so that when those those crises happen or when the losses or the changes happen we've already started to lay that foundation excellent 
Excellent explanation. Excellent, excellent explanation. Rose? Um, the connection isn't good. Um, yeah. One of the things that, uh, as Lindsay was talking, I thought, how did your camera people cope? How did you set up your other people that, how did they cope with confronting this? Can you sort of, because they're people that weren't maybe as passionate about it as you. So did you have to prime them when they went, when they went out with you about like with, within the discussion about the project, how many people did you have to reassure that it was okay to be there with the people, with the grieving people? Yeah, that really wasn't too much of an issue. I think, you know, we've had a really a wonderful team and the team is pretty small. So on, on productions, it would be myself, a camera person and an audio person. So it's just three people. Uh, for our core team that works with our with our station at WPSU, we actually did a training where we brought in a grief uh, grief counselor and we did a full day training to get us ready to hold space for those wow. people and also to to care for ourselves and start to address our own grief and that this could be triggering. And then we ended up using a few uh, freelance workers who just, you know, especially our, our director of photography, she she was phenomenal. She, without sharing too much of her story, had had some, some grief of her own. And so she was all in. She was wonderful. And I think it was just, it, it becomes such a warm, genuine space, even though it's hard. It really was never an issue to hold that. I mean, there were definitely days I think we were all good at checking in with each other too. Um, and, you know, on anything you're out on the road, things can get a little stressful. Um, but I think by and large, we all just appreciated it. And our whole team, not just the people directly involved with our production, we have a, an amazing instructional designer and web designer who've been hard at work on the website and our project manager who all have viewed all this content, even if over and over and over, even if they weren't there in the rooms. And, you know, sometimes we will just, you know, we try to be co cognizant of that. Like, I, I know enough of some of my team. I know when I'm sending things their way that might be a little triggering for them. And I, you know, maybe not always, but I really try to be like, hey, heads up when you watch this, it deals with this and just FYI, um, you know, we each have different things that affect us differently. Uh, but I think the team has just been so supportive and has universally been so passionate about this. Because again, I think we realized that we tapped into something really special that it, it was never an issue of, of getting, and we would have, I mean, before every production, I would tell everyone, you know, we're here to hold space that this is not going to be a normal interview where normally we might get everything we need in a half an hour. Or so we would be there for, you know, two, almost three hours. Sometimes it was basically just, this is their time. If someone is going to trust us with this personal experience, we're going to get, we're going to sit here for all of it and not rush, not worry about the schedule. This is why we're here. Wow. Yeah. Really? Well, that's, what's so beautiful about, about how you've put it together that yeah. that that there's a sense of real space for hearing this but the thing is out in the everyday world we need to be able to do that for our loved ones just be there and without interrupting and without a pacifying and they've gone to a better place well how are we to know that they've gone to a better place you know <laughs> we just hope that they also have, assumes that we all share the not, same beliefs which we might not yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, or they had a good life and you think, well, did they have a good life? Or, or what's the other thing? Um, oh, it's, yeah, well, you know, you had them for so long, you were so lucky. Yeah, there's a weird thing that and happens with that. It's, I'll say. it's easier to say. Especially around older adults, and we're seeing this a lot with COVID, right? Where where it's it's being yeah. minimized as like, well, it's mostly older adults that are most likely to die, and we're like, so that makes it less right. awful. You know, my grandmother died in February; she was ninety seven. It didn't help <laughs> that she was yeah. ninety seven and lived a long life that was that I exactly. knew was a good life. I still miss her. She's still not here with me anymore, and. And I think um, I'm going to steal uh, Megan Devine is a, is a brilliant author and, and a grief advocate. And she was one of our advisors on this project. She's featured in the film and she has something I love called the second half of the sentence, which is all of those platitudes that we're kind of taught are the things to say in grief come with this sort of unspoken second half of the sentence that pretty much is always so stop being so sad. So 
if, it, if you're saying, well, at least they lived a it good is. life. So stop being so sad. You know, that's always the parenthetical. They're in a better place. So stop being so sad. So she, her job yep. for everyone is if you can apply that to whatever about you're going to say, don't say it. <laughs> you might mean it so well. Um, but, and, and again, it's like, we feel like we have to say something or have to, and I'm, I will raise my hand. I've said those things. I've said those things even since I've started this work and I know better because they're really deeply ingrained. And that's another important message is even if you you do say the thing or you mess up, it's okay. This goes back to that authenticity and humility. It's okay to own that and to go back, you know, a day later, an hour later, whenever you realize that, oh, I, that really wasn't what I meant. You can go back and say, I know this caused you pain. It wasn't what I meant to say, but I know the impact still caused you pain. What I really meant to say was I care about you and I'm struggling because it's so hard to see you hurting and I just don't know what to do. And to just not not let because you're going to mess up in this space, right? Like it's such a tricky space. It's, um, you know, expert after expert said that people who do this for a living and have done it for decades, they mess up all the time time because it's just when something is so deeply personal and, and intense as grief, there's going to be missteps. And again, it's about building the type of honest connection where, where these relationships can survive those missteps. Um, and now that being said, there might be, if there's someone in your life who's trying to support you and you've tried to give them honest feedback and tried to kind of guide that and it keeps happening, maybe the best thing you can do for you and your grief is to make some distance. So we're not saying that, you know, and, and there's a saying that grief changes your address book because it, it, it will often change in both directions. You might lose or, or there might be some distance between you and people who traditionally have been your core network, but you'll also probably be surprised and who becomes part of that core network going forward because you'll find different people who are able to hold space for you and and different people who have different skill sets like we're all, we're not all good at the same things and that's okay we don't have to be if everyone did contributed what their strength was you're still being supported mm -hmm. yeah that's true yeah and and also the um i was just thinking about the the, the support that um people give like they provide food they provide all sorts of things in grief and you know i was just reflecting on you know tova was saying about people in con and chronic pain um, often it's their grief that they're keeping back because it, it like is it from shame is it from being you know strong i i don't need to show that i'm hurting in my heart for for the loss could be the loss of a job it could be the loss of a a a, a love person a, you know a, a relationship it doesn't have to be a death does it grief can be all over the place and that that's one of the things that you know drew me when i saw lindsay's program i thought i've got to bring this out and share it because mm -hmm. pain and suffering is part of you know uh, the human condition and and last week we had um the, um, the two psychologists talking about um, getting through to the other side and having peace, and and it's through it's through acknowledging our suffering that will bring us peace, won't it? You know that that whole idea that it's okay to um, to miss this particular person, and and getting through that. And and actually, I remember one of my friends saying to me when my own mother died she'll come back to you. And I used to think, what do you mean she'll come back? <laughs> and, you know, she became integrated. And quite surprisingly, one day, I thought, she's integrated with me somehow. I, I couldn't, I couldn't sort of put a, a, a finger on it. But um, it happened. So right. and, and uh, as soon as we uh, acknowledge our grief and acknowledge our sadness, the person somehow returns in a, in a in a different sort of yeah. way within our but, I think maybe we recognize the good and the bad in them maybe something like that and we accept them uh, yeah, it's very yeah. true and the, you know, yeah and, and I uh, think oh go ahead I wanted to say in the Jewish in the Jewish tradition which is there's a seven day shiva which is profound because it's a space for everybody to to reflect and what you mean by 
hopefully getting the validation they need and to working through issues and to deal with the family and the community. And it's profound. And it's, it's a direct polarization to what's happening now with Corona where people can't even see their dead ones. It's like, wow, to have, you know, a whole week to have process it and then to have nothing. I mean, Rose had her son's grandfather, her son-in-law's grandfather passed and like 10 people could come and it was just, a, it was it was a chaos, right, Rose? But that happened. It was so. When I'm thinking about yeah, yeah, the 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 polarization of of even just for us to experience it, and and look, you know, and then in some of the cultures, there's an open casket, which is a very important thing to see the person, you know, to see the person and 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 connect with them, and that's it's very wonderful. It's not in the Jewish, but I know in others, and it's also a way. So you look at the different cultures, and you see people attempting to figure out a way to say goodbye that's right yeah yeah well as as tova said like once upon a time we'd we'd have a wake and and everything and now that's all gone and even you know not even lighting a candle for the people anymore you know that right. those old customs right. are already you know they were public and, you know, it was a 40-day memorial thing used to happen. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't happen anymore. And, and as you said, Lindsay, it's about youth, isn't it? It's about keeping ourselves away from that smelly thing called death, isn't it? And, and, uh, and, and grief comes with it, yeah. And they used to tear their clothes once upon a time, mm -hmm. didn't they? They do to that. show the and grief they publicly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, wear black. And that, that is one of yeah. the things you mentioned about, about the past is we don't really display our mourning anymore. And that's changed. You know, there used to be an outward show. That, um, you know, and I'll, I'll, you know, when I remember when my, when my first grandmother died about four years ago, I'll never forget um, going into work. And, you know, my whole goal for the day was just to not burst into tears at, at the conference table. And Jeez. I remember thinking, you know, having a, and I'm someone, you know, I usually do choose to, to go to work or to do something. I tend to, um, to grieve through action um, or to, you know, to focus on things. Um, and I remember having a conversation where someone was trying to give me critical feedback and not that I cared, you know, it wasn't that I was upset about the feedback, but I remember distinctly thinking, I could not care less about this right now. Like my grandmother is dead. I will never see her again. Like, and I just wish I had a shirt on that could say, leave me alone. I don't care. I'm grieving. And, you know, and that's what black garments used to give us. That's what, um, you know, outward displays or the rending of the garments used to give us. And, and we've definitely lost that. Um, but Rose, you had said something that made me think of um, you talking about, uh, about your, your mom showing up or about going through life in a, a, one of our advisors uh, named Elizabeth Brady, who's just a beautiful writer, I had interviewed her for a radio program I did. And I asked her, because she's a writer, her, her son Mac died just before his ninth birthday in, I believe, 2012. And I said, how would, what word would you use for your grief in that acute phase, right? And an acute phase can be months or years, but right after Mac died, and how would you describe it now? She said, acutely, I would describe it as an amputation. Now I would describe it as tender. And I think that's to your point. And, and that's what I've heard echoed with a lot of people is that we need to shift from the idea that grief ends to grief changes. It, it does get different over time. It does, uh, most people have described it as it becomes a little bit easier to breathe and it lowers the volume enough that you can focus on other things. But I think when we set ourselves up for that, I'm going to complete it and I'm going to be done and I'm never going to be triggered emotionally thinking about this person I love that died. That's when we get into that place of, of repressing thing because we're not letting ourselves have that Melancholy. release when it comes. Mm -hmm. wow, 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 wow. Mm. And it's often <clears throat> depression then comes from it, doesn't it? Like, you know, if you don't grieve and you ignore your, your grief, um, that that heavy feeling of, of depression and life isn't worth living and, uh, you know, I need to curl up in a ball and die myself. But the, 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 um, the loved one would want you, the opposite, wouldn't they? If, if you look at it from that angle, you know, that they've got no, they've got no desire for you to die 
internally because they've gone and uh and unfortunately yeah and and you know like that whole idea is, as tova said about having that seven days or whatever or or 40 days in some cultures uh just allows that person to be there and and you know like in italy once upon a time i haven't seen it recent years but there'd be all these old ladies in black all over the place mm -hmm. and uh you knew that they were widows and uh and there's a sort of a respect or something for them yeah or deference you know like yeah it brings out a sense of compassion for that person somehow doesn't it having that external sign and having to go back to work the next day after your grandmother dying well you know to me that's sort of like mm -hmm. yeah and it's you know and bereavement leaves a whole other issue stay home <laughs> Oh, and I had, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I had, I think, I, you know, and it depends, I think I got like a day, you know, they do it basically by your relationship with the person. And I had, I had vacation time and things that I could have taken. Um, but that was probably my first um, adult loss. Like, I'm trying to think if that was the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think I just didn't really yeah. know what to do. Oh, and in both, actually, since, you know, my, my other grandmother died this past February and it was the same thing where I, I was in this space. I know more about grief now, but I kind of made the decision of, I want to go and just try to go to work today to just have something to do because it was a weird, um, it was, I always say it's, it's, unex it seems strange to say someone at 97 dying is unexpected, but it was kind of unexpected. And I, I was, it was like in the middle of the week and I was going to go home on the weekend to see my parents, but I just was kind of in, a little bit stunned. And, um, I was like, you know what, I just want to have my routine today. Just even if I'm a mess and you know, my whole goal, I think I sent like one email. I didn't, I, 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 I had myself go to work, but I did hold the space for myself. That's like, I don't expect to accomplish much other than to be here and, um, to have something to do. Um, that's not, you know, um, I don't know. I had someone recently uh, I was talking with too about like my first instinct a lot in grief. Um, so another instance in my family, I had, I lost a cousin very young and suddenly and tragically to an overdose. And my first instinct after I got that news was I had just finished reading Marie Kondo's book about organization. And I went and organized all the drawers in my apartment because I needed, because <laughs> I think that gave me a sense of control or it gave me a focus and it was very soothing to me and so you know some of us grieve and, and you know i'm comfortable speaking about my grief but some of us speak grief basically by speaking it and some of us like to talk through it and and in the moment and then some of us like to or like i like to work on my house so i'll go look for what can i build or what can i knock down or what can i um you know as a as a physical manifestation or i like to rock climb that's very soothing to me so i think that goes back to that grief is so unique and we can get, that's also where we can creep into that judgmental space of if you, if you see someone else doing that, like somebody might look at me and say, how could you go to work? Wouldn't you be? And it's one of those things where it's like, let's just make it, oh, well, that's how that person chose to do it. But we tend to get in this, well, that's not how I would do it. Or that's not how I've seen other people do it. Ergo, it must be wrong. And there's, there's, I always say like, if, you, if you're not hurting yourself or someone else in your grief, chances are whatever you're doing is probably okay. You know, if that's, if you're drawing comfort from it, if you like to go for walks, if you like to do ceramics, whatever it is that's helping you, go for it. Yeah, true. Actually, you've you've made a very important point because unless it's a sort of an immediate person, um, you've got to do something to stay normal, to stay focused, and, and because often we um, we shatter. I think it's probably mm -hmm. a good way of putting it. And so staying focused, I, I just want to uh, to mention that um, when I used to have staff, if their animals were sick or died, I used to sort of say to the staff, just take a day off if someone close to them died or whatever, but their animal, which is very close to them, um, you, you know, you, you're supposed to tend to, you know, come back to work. And especially with people who are caring for other people, like like the nursing staff, they needed to be actually able to acknowledge 
that they also have personal grief because they're looking at other people's grief day in and day out and and supporting them and being there for them and then often when it happens to um, uh, a caregiving person uh, that support isn't there um, to the same extent so just by allowing them to to feel that they can grieve over their animal and that you know uh, it gave them space to come back refreshed because a lot of caregivers and, um, and medical staff um, have burnout and I often wonder if the burnout is not so much about the work they're doing but the fact that they don't get or give themselves the support that they give other people that was mm. just a comment that's, too. no for, it's very very for wise medical, and health people I um and that's something that we talk about excuse me in the film and in the broader project too is that we think of grief as just being about emotions but grief is physical they're like real physical things again i'm not a, i'm not a clinician this is this is not for me this is from the experts there's physical symptoms it does things to your brain and to your ability to reason and remember things and complete tasks so there are all these things that again people will often say i thought i was losing my mind because they don't know that like this is grief that it and then you get into um, secondary losses and talking about logistical things. Um, you know, you might have to move. So then you're grieving your home with your memories and your support communities. You are, if you lost a spouse, you're losing that partner who helped you with the day-to-day -day things. There's so many things that go along with it that we don't um, recognize. We think it's just, oh, you're grieving, you're sad. Right. But I've had, I have a lot of people also say they'll be simultaneously happy because they're thinking about their person or they'll feel joy or they'll feel gratitude but they're still grieving, you know, that, that even those like good feelings, air quotes, are part of, um, are part of grief. And so to your point about uh, going back to work, I always caution like employers, like even if you don't want to think about it, if it sounds too mushy to think about like being compassionate, think about like your, your person's probably not going to be at their peak performance the day after or <laughs> days or weeks after um, a major loss exactly. or major diagnosis. Yeah. You probably don't yeah. want them sending emails to your to your <laughs> stakeholders because they're just they're they're going through something. Um, and one thing I, I just remembered that you'd said way earlier, Rose, that I wanted to touch on about trying to be strong and not um, like we don't like to ask for help. That's actually something we're adding to the site and we're trying to convey. And I'll share without getting too detailed. My family's sort of going through something right now, and we're seeing this when we are grieving or when we have any kind of life trial, we we're, we're so taught to be proud and that accepting help makes you a burden on someone else or that you're burdening them or that you're showing weakness. And having been on both sides of this, I, I wish if I could leave people with something, it's that allowing people to help you is actually such a gift and such a kindness. Because if you think about like what we were talking about before, sitting with someone when they're in deep pain, someone that you care about, and you know that you can't fix the core root of their pain, but maybe you can take out the recycling for them or you can take their kids to the zoo for the afternoon so they can have a moment alone. Is the support person, we're so happy to be able to do that. Like we're so thrilled that we can do one small thing for our person. And when we're on the receiving end, it feels like, oh, well, that's such an imposition on you. So I would love people who are in the position of maybe needing some help right now to just know. So, so again, my family's going through something and our neighbors cut the grass for us while we had to be out of town. And that was wow. huge. <laughs> it was such a gift and it seems so small, but that just made such a difference. My husband didn't have to worry about it while we were dealing yeah. with some other things. And, you know, I've had, I had a friend who her dad died and I was, I was on the other side of it where I was like, I really want to do something for you. And, she, and I kind of kept trying to offer some things and I wasn't getting anywhere. And she finally, said, well, we've been eating out at, at this one restaurant a lot. I was like, done, gift card's going to be in the mail in 20 minutes. Like, cause I was so happy that I knew I couldn't solve the fact that her dad died, but I could at least get them food for the night. Um, and that's, you know, where the, the bringing of food comes yeah. in. But I also urge people, it's so much more than just the bringing of the food. The food is great, but there are so many other little things like that, like the cutting of the grass or the day-to-day -day things that are not a burden are, are yeah, a in kind the movie, of. In the movie, the woman said that she got a call from someone who said, I'm sending somebody over to pick up your dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. uh, are you there at five? The person will be there at five or five. 
and then they're going to bring it back tomorrow. Will you be there? So and so, all folded and cleaned, and the woman was just like blown away. Like, what a perfect thing to get done. And mowing the lawn, and it's brilliant, and it's very common sense. But we're we're thinking like, should I go deeper? It's like really the very basic things. It's so true. You, you brought so many amazing points yeah. brought up in the, in the oh, movie. Thank the you. Well, and it is, it's basic because a lot of times those basic needs, like that's the last thing you want to be dealing with in any kind of a crisis. So that is such right. a kindness. And, and I'm glad you brought that up, Tova, because that's another, um, like the kind of platitudes that everything happens for a reason. I mean, what's the most common thing we say in any crisis? We say, let me know if you need anything or let me know how I can help you. And again, very genuinely, I think we offer that, but we aren't factoring in, like we just talked about, all of those, those physical and cognitive and emotional and logistical challenges that this person's already dealing with. And again, we can look at inside even a, a devastating medical diagnosis or, or something like chronic pain. You're, you're on overload. You're so, you don't have space to think, you can't even think of your normal routine. You're not thinking about, oh, are we out of eggs? Are we, you know, what do I need from the store? So that's another thing we're trying to coach is to, we still want to give people agency. So, um, you know, I think it's still good practice to say, I was thinking of doing this for you. Would that be okay with you? But make a specific offer. Because if you just say, let me know if you need anything, you're yes. asking them to figure that out and then have the courage to put themselves in that vulnerable situation. Because again, we don't like feeling like we're burdening people, even if we're not. So trying to offer a few things or, you know, I'm out, um, I, I have some time Saturday afternoon, I'm going to run some of my errands. Is there anything, um, you know, can I run an errand for you? Can I pick up your mail for you? Any of those little mundane things are, are amplified so much and become so overwhelming when you're grieving. So therefore, when you're a support person, even if it seems like the smallest little thing to take someone's recycling out, it is such a gift to that person. True. There's a question. Yeah. Um, but it's all, not only that, it sort of means that it's not just waiting for someone to be, you know, I'm waiting here for you to tell me what you want. But you're mm -hmm. actually involved with that person and make making a, an emotional connection, a deeper emotional connection than any of the of the things. Oh, I don't know what to say. Um, just being there, and and often, you know, especially with women, they'll actually come into the home, and just take over and mm -hmm. and allow allow the person to grieve. And it's beautiful as a nurse, you know, with palliative mm -hmm. care, and seeing families sort of pull in, and allow the principal people to to grieve or to spend time with their person who's dying, and then. You know, you see this whole bunch of friends, neighbours coming in, taking care of the kids, taking the kids to school, doing whatever, and it's a beautiful, a beautiful experience. Actually, I've got goosebumps thinking about it because it is, uh, it sort of sees the, you know, that human condition at its fullest. And and um, as you said in the in the introduction, you know, you're interested in the human condition. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, it's been amazing. Mia has got some thoughts here. Yeah. Can we have um, a look at those all, before? Yeah. yeah, I'm having some thoughts. So when something is more obvious, like some of your family member died or similar people get in and maybe offer help in that time. But when you're in a long process of grief, as example, childhood grief that still is around, people don't know how to deal with that or don't get that. Then the person also needs support from the outside. It's not so obvious. And then True. you're often left alone because it's not so easy to face why this person is grieving. So she wants to know, could you talk more about how we can get to our, her own, your, our own grief, how to acknowledge it and how to be with it without escaping? Yeah, so I, I think I heard two things in that question. The first is, is she had mentioned, um, you know, childhood mm -hmm. grief that's still around. That is so important. And that's something that we talk about a lot in the film, going back to that idea of that grief does not end. Um, and that even like I said, we'll say the early days of grief, but again, days, days, when I say early days, that could be years for some people. Like that could be a lot of grieving people have said that the second year is actually worse for them than the first year is because the first year you're still sort of in a state of shock where it doesn't feel real. And you're not even kind of at the core of the grief experience yet, because you're still, everything is still new. You're doing the first holidays or the first birthdays without them. But then that second year, you've gone through it once and it, it really kind of sets in 
this is for real, this is how it's going to be. Um, and so I say that not to frighten people, but just to have that compassion for yourself of if, if we have this expectation that, you know, after 12 weeks, you're fine. Um, that And that goes to the support piece of we're trying to encourage people to readjust how long they think grief lasts and keep checking in with your person. So I don't know what the specific grief is, but that's that's huge of like, even if you just set a reminder in your calendar, check in with so-and-so every, and it goes off automatically every two weeks, every two months, whatever you feel they need. Um, and don't be afraid. And that goes to like, I think we don't know what to say. And I, I struggle with that sometimes too, if I'm sending a text to someone, never underestimate the power of just like, hey, I'm thinking about you today, or hey, this popped up. And I thought, you know, it made me think this might be a hard day for you or, or whatever it is. So keep checking in. Um, and then with the processing your own grief, I would say one thing um, that's been really helpful for me on this project is I've started trying to do that with, um, I don't like calling them big and little griefs, but sort of, you know, COVID has shown us like with these shutdowns, there's so many things that we experience that probably have an element of grief in them. Um, so trying to be more conscious about recognizing that in, in your own grief. And I think if we can start with maybe those, um, again, I hate using smaller, but for lack of a better term, those more kind of day-to-day -day griefs, um, that recognition starts to build up. And then I think it makes it easier to recognize in ourself or someone else when the sort of bigger griefs happen. Um, and also to to the point that we touched on earlier, where we think of grief as just being synonymous with sadness, that grief is so much more, that anger is so huge. That was such a big part of pretty much everyone I spoke with, that anger was huge in grief. Um, anxiety. Yes. Um, I'm, a, I'm someone, my grief tends, I'm an anxious person to begin with. And when I grieve, it, it kind of amps up my anxiety level. Fear is huge in grief. Um, confusion, numbness, like there's so many different things. And again, we have some great resources. I'll plug our website around that. But when, when we start realizing that all of those feelings are part of grief, I think it makes it easier to recognize, am I really feeling anxious because of this reason? Or am I feeling anxious because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grieving over something and, and it's being triggered by whatever little thing just set me off. But now I'm kind of in this grief loop in my head. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I reflected on as you were talking is the fact that we judge, you know, you said earlier on about judging good grief or bad grief or whatever, or good emotions, good feelings, bad feelings, and, and to remind everyone that really a feeling is a feeling, it's neither good nor bad. And, and with grief usually comes rage and anger, A, because the person's left you or or because something's been unresolved and and that silent sort of like emptiness sort of uh, continues in people until they open up and uh, and that's what with chronic pain mostly um, you find that the people have actually got some personal grief going on that they haven't that they haven't dealt with and and us and you know if i look at mia's comments there it's so important to actually acknowledge the fact that you could be pretty angry about the person dying on you or dying too soon or not looking after themselves and virtually, you know, killing themselves with, uh, I mean, like tobacco or smoking or whatever. And, and then the yeah. person dies and they might be 70 or whatever, but they didn't need to die in that sort of manner. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I, I think if there's a feeling we are even less comfortable with in sadness, it's definitely anger. Um, and, and, and in allowing that to be part of grief, um, I think is so important. And your comments made me think of um, a woman named Z who's featured in the film and is on the website. And um, she spoke about her mother had a prolonged battle with breast, I believe it was breast cancer. And the anger while her mother was in treatment where she would get frustrated because it's still a mother daughter dynamic. You're still going to get frustrated with your person, but there's something that happens when someone has a, a serious or a terminal diagnosis where we feel like we're not allowed to say anything bad. Or if, if you say something, if you express yeah. anger about that person, you're a bad person for saying that. And so she said now kind of her um, grief work is when one of her friends is in a similar situation, she will always offer to them, I'm the person that you can call up, you can say all the angry, bad things, I won't judge you. 
um, so that you can be whole when you go back and have that interaction with your person, because you're not going to say it to them while they're on, you know, going through treatment, but you can't just hold it in or else it just bottles up and then it, it, it ruins it. So I would say too, like, yeah, hold space for anger in your own grief and for other people as they grieve. It's really true. I think Very what's well important said. is- Lizzie, um, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to say one quick thing. We have another minute or two, but if maybe, so, if there's any more questions um, before Lindsay gets back to work, um, we have a lot of people watching. And I just would like to say one thing, which is so fascinating, which ties in with our work and will tie in with you and, you know, it's like we are we do have other people and relationships we're relationship beings and we're affected by other people but ultimately we need to have the self-compassion for ourselves in order to move on and to help the relationships but it's the relationship with us and how we grieve and how we this is what ultimately i think is the where the healing can happen and the person can be yes i'm grieving but i'm whole I'm sad my mother died, but I'm whole. I forget, you know, I will always have a scar, but I'm whole. And this is, I think, where we can help each other become whole as we deal with these emotions that are just, and deal with the unknown. I mean, like, where do we come from and where are we going is another whole documentary. Where are we going? You know, and if we had more <laughs> control, if we had more control about the hereafter, you know, we would we would feel better about our journey. So this is a whole nother. So it's fascinating information. And I, I mean, we've just been so thrilled. I'm so blessed that Rose found you and that you um, agree. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. So I, I do just I want to just plug one more time. I encourage everyone to go to speakinggrief.org and really spend some time. I definitely hope you watch the documentary. But um, there's just there's so much more there. There's so many, uh, like I said, so many helpful tips and, and and practical things that you can try to put into practice and videos. Um, and then also we're at WPSU Grief on Facebook and Instagram, and we put out some kind of unique um, content that we make, especially for those platforms around grief that are um, that are shareable, so we can start this education more broadly. Um, but thank you so much, Tova and Rose, and everyone who participated. It's been a great conversation. Yeah. Thanks, okay, Lindsay. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Have a wonderful day. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week. Have a wonderful week. Be in touch if you want to see the tape of Lindsay. Uh, it'll be on the Facebook in a few minutes and. Bless all your hearts. Be well. Good night. Good afternoon. Good morning, Rose. Bye, honey.